Shalom everyone, Yoel here for an episode of Tzor Lamikra. Uh, this week we are in Chayei Sarah. And for those who are wondering, the one for Vayera has not been recorded due to a, a very bad case of the flu. Uh, I will complete that recording, don't worry about it. There's a lot to say uh, about Vayera. There's a lot of discussions here, some of them very important to have theological meanings and so on. I'll get to it, don't worry. Um, Chaye Sarah. First of all, this is a very uh, interesting time to study the story of Chaye Sarah because of the decision by UNESCO, which is one of the UN bodies, uh, to take over the Tomb of the Patriarchs and claim that it's an, a Muslim site. Uh, obviously, the structure on the site is most definitely not Muslim. Uh, it's actually Herodian. The Structures underneath it are not Muslim. Everything that's Muslim is actually completely superficial on the site. Um, unfortunately, the UN is not really anymore a UN. It's uh, really more of a, um, more of a UNA, United Nations of Arabia. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of Arab countries that uh, have full control of the UN, and uh, which puts Israel in a minority all the time, and many other things. And uh, for those who have never actually visited Hebron, Hebron is a very, very, very old city. We're talking about a city that has constructions in it that date into the Bronze Age. There are buildings there that um, are some, considered to be an impossibility because some of the, there are walls, they're called the, gi the giant walls, um, which are considered to be walls that... Uh, are built from such large, uh, large stones that there's this ongoing discussion about how on earth did they move them there, how did they build such a thing, and so on. Uh, but in any case, Hebron has had a very, very long Jewish history. There was a Karite community there many years ago. Jews have been living there for a very, very long time. It was the center of a lot of the conflict pre-State of Israel. And um, this is all very, very important because it, lo it actually locks into something that appears in this parasha that unfortunately many people actually miss when they read it. And this is actually something I point out to all of my students when they study and we do uh, reading sections. I use these, I uh, use certain very specific uh, sections in the Bible uh, to teach very specific um, ideas and concepts. And one of the very, very unique things that we actually have in this parasha is a contract. Um, this is something relatively rare. We have contracts from the ancient world. I mean, there are m many, many documents of transactions between different individuals. If it's, if it's items, if it's land, if it's structures. Uh, we have loads and loads of things that we could compare this story to to uh, to contracts and therefore it's actually very easy if you pay attention to actually see the elements of the contract here and so this is a very very important and very very interesting uh insight and there actually are scholars that claim that maybe even sections of the original contract were are embedded in this story the other thing that we have here is also the element of negotiation we get to see uh, um, almost like a, a live uh, account of how negotiations worked. There are a few other small things here that I want to point out that we'll get to while we read. First of all, the parasha is called Chayei Sarah, the life of Sarah. Chayei Sarah is a construct state of the word Chayim, which means life. Obviously, Sarah is Sarah's name. And it points out that she lived 127 years. And the counting of people's ages is sometimes more to point out the, peop the person's favor in the eyes of God than just stating, oh, they lived a very long time. It was a sign of great blessing. And this is why when people lived to a great age, it was pointed out. Uh, you take, for example, you know, the idea of people living a very long time um, is obviously not unique to the Bible. It's something that we find, for example, in the Sumerian king list, uh, but the, the, the ages there in the Sumerian king list is just impossible. These are people that presumably live tens of thousands of years. But we find that, the, the, that this idea of people living a very long time wasn't something unusual. 
and shows that the Bible is set in, in the ancient world. However, we also have to be very careful when we do comparative stuff because sometimes it can lead us also to the conclusion that something copied, someone copied from something and so on, and there's nothing genuine. But again, you have to be very careful with these ideas because at the end of the day, um, shared ideas doesn't mean people were copying, and shared ideas doesn't mean that they completely shared because you can also have situations where one person had uh, had taken an idea and, and basically turned it into something unreal. The Bible is actually very careful about that. It doesn't it doesn't really create impossible legends. It's very careful with it. It's considered to be one of the unique elements of the uh, of the Hebrew Bible that a lot of the mythical elements are completely diffused in the Hebrew Bible. But in any case, the danger in comparative studies is that it, you, it, depend, it really depends on how you interpret things. One person can say, oh yeah, so this shows the Bible is really just part of that gigantic legend. Or to say the opposite, oh look, the Bible actually can be clearly dated and set in a very specific place. And really not everything that people said back then was complete legend. I mean, the number of times that people discovered that something was real is immense. Take, for example, the case of Troy. Troy was considered to be legend until they actually found it. Um, so, uh, you know, today in the age of enlightenment, as they call it, uh, we've put, we've flooded everything with so much light, we actually can't see the evidence. And the evidence is that many of the legends of the ancient world are actually real. The question is, what exactly were the details? And this is where the Bible steps in and says, a lot of the stuff that you know from the ancient world and legends is nonsense, okay? There is actually something completely different, very natural, very down to earth. And this is why, for example, a miracle is a miracle because it's unique. You know, when if something happens all the time, it's no longer a miracle, it's nature. Uh, so the Bible is very careful in, in, in drawing the lines between the natural and the supernatural. But in any case, um, she, Sarah dies and Abraham uh, weeps over her. And we see here some of the process of the mourning. Um, you, um, you weep over a person. And then it is your obligation as a member of family to bury this individual. Not to bury someone was considered to be a curse. And I've mentioned the whole story with Sargon II, that he died on the battlefield and he was he was actually not buried. And this sparked rebellion all over the, the all over Mesopotamia because of the fact that they considered it to be a curse on Assyria. Many of the nations saw this as a curse because the king was the living embodiment of the kingdom and the moment something happens with the king the entire kingdom is in danger this is why for example they had the sapatu or the shapatu which was a prohibition on the king um, based on the moon cycle every seventh day either seventh day 14th day or seventh day 15th day and then it depends if it's 21 or 22 uh, that the king was not allowed to be outside, he's not allowed to do any work, and so on, uh, because it endangers him, and if the king is in danger, the entire kingdom is in danger. Uh, but in any case, burying someone was a very, very important act. It was part of the, 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 the last rights that that person has, and it's the way to show full respect to a person. In Judaism, it's actually called Chesed Shel Emet. A Chesed Shel Emet is a... A, a, true, a, a righteous deed of truthfulness because you, you're doing this without receiving any gratitude from anyone. Um, this is why, you know, it's a, it's a big thing in Judaism to make sure that if someone is buried, it's done with great honor and, you know, at least bring a minimum of 10 people to bury someone. Um, remember when I was in high school, we, we received a phone call and we were sent out as the seniors who we were sent out to, uh, to help bury someone because this individual... Um, had no family, so they went to make sure that there's, there's at least a, a minyan, at least ten people standing there. So we were, were taking with a taken with a taxi, and we we made sure this person was buried. So this is a very very big um, issue for 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 people in the ancient world and also for Jews. And he Avraham gets up and he turns around to the sons of Chet. Chet basically are the Chetites, and in this period, uh, the Chetites were actually uh, a growing kingdom, and they, they, there's a, a lot of evidence of them controlling um, a lot of areas here in the land, and they were actually in conflict with the Egyptians, 
um, over over land. They were in dispute with the Egyptians, and they battled with one another until the famous Battle of Kadesh of the of the fourteenth century, where um, they finally came to an agreement. So Hittites living here is not something that we're supposed to be surprised about, and he turns around to them and he says, "Ger v'toshav imachem." This term "ger v'toshav." Um, this term turned at one point into Ger Toshav, which is a hybrid, which is completely incorrect. For those who want to understand this concept, you can actually go to the video section, and there is a section there about conversion in the Bible, where I explain the whole concept of Ger, ger and Toshav and so on, uh, literally from the Bible itself. This, what I describe there is, the, is um, the, most, the most clear and most definite explanation to this subject, uh, people mix in a lot of weird things into into the into the items, and, and it's really just not that. Ger is one thing, Toshav is another thing. Ger ve Toshav, basically, he's using this as a, as a, he's using this hyperbole uh, to indicate that he's a complete stranger with no rights. So Ger means someone who dwells. Toshav is also someone who dwells. But what's the difference between them? A Ger is a person who is committed to the laws of the land, and he's there permanently, but just doesn't have rights as a citizen, as a native born. A Toshav is really a person who's there for an extended period of time, but no commitment to anything, he's, he might leave at one point, and so on. A Gel has some kind of rights. Uh, a Toshav has almost absolutely nothing. So in many cases, a Toshav is can be someone who is a wanderer, or someone who is a uh, uh, someone who passes through and sits there for a short while. So, for example, when someone is uh, an adversary, for example, if you're if you're moving to live somewhere just for a year, your status is really a toshav. There's no ger. Ger is um, usually someone who's there for longer than that. And actually, in some uh, residential laws that we find from the Persian era, uh, a person is not considered to be a, a, a resident of a city until a year passes. So a toshav can also be defined based also on how long the person is going to be, is living there or is going, or is going to be living there. A ger is already a person who's gone beyond that stage. He's there for quite a while and he's committed to the laws of the land. Um, so he says, to them, he says to them that he is a complete stranger, but he's requesting, give me an achuzat kevil. Now, achuzat kevil is, is, a very, is, is a little bit of a specific term here. And what's specific here is that he doesn't want just a tomb. He was just used. He could he just use the word kevil. He says achuzat kevil, something that can I can grab a hold of. An achuza is um, a property that you grab a hold of. It is different from a nachala. Nachala is in the root nachal. It's to inherit. Okay. Isaac, for example, does no, no longer has an achuzat kevil. It's right now an achala. Because he inherits it from his father, but for Avraham, this is an achuza. Okay, it's an it's it's an it's an estate that he buys and has ownership due to grabbing, due to for in this case grabbing a deed and making it to his own. And there's a reason he insists on this. The reason throughout the entire reading he insists on this location not to be a gift. And the reason he insists on this is because he wants holding to the ground and he wants his descendants to have rights on this place. He wants the people who are buried here that their descendants will have rights on these, on these places. And this is, this is basically what I connected earlier regarding the, the UNESCO and so on. This is a site that was bought by Abraham, passed down to Isaac, and then passed down to Jacob as an as a, a owned property bought with money, with all the legal terminology, and therefore will always belong by law to the descendants of Israel. Because he gave it to Isaac. Ishmael was never buried there. He gave it to Isaac. Esav wasn't buried there. Though there's this rumor that his head is buried there, I'm very, I'm very doubtful of that. Um, but, uh, but Avraham passed this down to Yitzchak, and then to Yaakov. And Yaakov specifically says, he asks Joseph that they will bury him in that specific tomb. There was a meaning here, the whole idea of the patriarchs being buried at this specific tomb, at this specific location, bought by the, the, by the ancestor of the family as something that they own. 
There's an important element here, and this element exists to this very day. Jews have a claim to the entire to the to the entire area surrounding the tomb and the tomb itself due to this contract. Muslims claim that they're descendants of Abraham, but that doesn't give them the right because they were not the ones who received the deed. The deed was passed on to the next descendant and then to the next descendant. Ishmael was pushed outside. Though most Arabs are also not necessarily Ishmaelites. Ishmael and Arab are not necessarily the same group of people. Okay? <coughs> so, he turns around to the sons of Chet. A lot of formality here. He turns around to the sons of Chet. And he says to them, give me a tomb. So they refer to him as a Nasi Elohim. They recognize him as a person of authority and as a person to respect because they understood his connection to the uh, to the divine. They realized this wasn't just some regular person who has money. This is a nasi Elohim. He, his 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 authority has nothing to do with the, with the group of people that he's with. It has to do with his authority as a divine person, that that he is connected to the divine. And they said, they say, oh, bury wherever you want. And so this is approval of him buying land. Now, this is very important that the entire congregation of Chet says this. And this is due to the fact that the Chetite laws in this period forbid uh, strangers from buying land because of the conflict with, with the Egyptians and other peoples. So the, the Chetites passed a law that forbade anyone from selling any land to any stranger to prevent any possibility of them losing strength and ground inside the Levant, specifically in the land of Israel. So even in a place, a remote area like Hebron, which is inside the mountains, which really has no strategic um, uh, meaning, they still prevented this. So for him, to, he had to receive approval of the entire community to be able to do this. This is why he turns around to all of them, and this is where the answer comes from all of them. To overcome this law, they have to do several things. So that's thing number one. So then it says, Abraham arose, he bowed down, because Ishtachava is in many cases translated as worship, but he is not worshiping, he's showing respect. There is actually a difference between bowing down to show respect and bowing down to worship. And actually, I remember many years ago, there was this um, debate that we were going through in high school regarding bowing down to someone, because we found it to be very peculiar, because bowing down was is one of the most definite signs of worship, but apparently in the ancient world, and even amongst the Israelites, there was no problem bowing down as a sign of respect, so intent was very, very important as well. So he bows down out of a sign of respect. It's also probably one of the features of uh, the negotiation. And he bows down le'am ha'aretz. Now, am ha'aretz is a term that got played around with it over with over and over and over again. In general, in the Bible, am ha'aretz means um, the owners of property. These were oligarchies. So this was an oligarchy and this was a democracy, which meant it was based on property. The more property you had, the more important you were in your society. So this this is actually good. These were the people of the land. These were the people who actually owned land. So he turns around. He specifically asks to speak with Ephron, the son of Tzohar, and they start negotiating. So he says to him in verse 9, Give me the, he, he states, Abraham states his will. He wants to speak with, with Ephron. He states that he wants the cave of Machpelah, from the root Kefer, which is a double. It's actually the double cave which is at the end of his field. Look at the specifications here. The name of the cave, where it is, and he says, Bechesef male, a full payment. Now, Kesef really means silver. This is why it says he weighs it. Coins didn't really exist in this area until around the 5th, 5th, 6th centuries. The first, some of the coins, first coins that we see are more from the Asia Minor, um, from the, the Persian-occupied Greek colonies of, of Asia Minor. And we have these tiny little coins that we find from this period. Uh, so here we're actually talking about pieces of silver. And really, any any gold or silver or copper found in this period is either in the form of gems, sorry, a form of, of, of jewelry, or in pieces. And um, 
and he speaks with the form. They go back and forth, back and forth. He wants to give him to free. He's refusing. Obviously, a negotiation tactic. But the point is that Ephron um, also states, now I'm going to do this in front of my people to make sure there are witnesses. Okay, another element of, uh, of, uh, of contracts. And Abraham bows down to him. And it says, for example, in verse 13, He spoke to in the ears of Ephron before all the people of the land. And he states his request. And Ephron says to him at verse Ephron says in verse 15, Adoni Shemaini, my Lord, hear me. Says to him, a land worth 400 shekels between you and I, what what is it? It's nothing. 400 shekels for a piece of property back then is a ridiculous price. This this is probably something like 20 times what the, the property value actually is based on certain estimates and documents that were found. And there's a question, why did he ask such a ridiculous price? What is what is this ridiculous price of 400 shekels? And the answer is part of the money is bribe money, that they had to pass on some of this money to silence people in the, in the, in the bureaucratic mechanism and to uh, make sure that this goes smoothly. So some of this money goes uh, to silence there's, there's another opinion I heard that actually says it wasn't to silence anyone, that there was some kind of a loophole in the law that says that if the person is willing to pay a massive amount of money, then they're perfectly fine with it. But it seems to be more that we're dealing here with a bribe, and and uh, it wasn't that Ephron was trying to milk Abraham. There's some people who say, oh, Ephron just exploited the situation, and therefore threw this massive price. No, there's, the re- there's actually a much more plausible explanation here which had to do with the Chittite laws and what they allowed and did, not, and, and did not allow when it came to dealing with property and strangers and so on. So it says that Ephron ve'ishma if Avraham, Ishma is to hear, which also means to accept in this case, and he weighs the money, he weighs the silver, and um, it specifically states that every many of the details are repeated over and over and over again because of the nature of the transaction. And it says that it's arba me'ot shekel kesef over la sochel. Over la sochel means that passes to the merchant. This is this is um, money. This is silver that has a a um, an approval stamp to it. It's not that the money is actually stamped, but that the money is considered to be the type of silver that is used in official transactions. So not only did he, not only that everything was done in front of everyone. Not only that there seems to be a contract here was probably written as well, because any co- anything like this has, has to be written, and there's plenty of evidence that they would write such a thing. But he also pays a very high price that's documented, that it's the, the number is repeated at least two, three times, and the location is repeated two, three times. But then it also specifically states that the type of money used is transactional money. This is not just regular silver, this is transactional silver. This is the type of silver that you do in any professional transaction. So it says then, in verse 17 is like this uh, last proclamation, or verses uh, uh, 17, 18, are, are this final proclamation that actually might appear at the end of the document that states, Vayakum sedeh ayfron asher b'machpela, asher lifne mamre, hasadeh v'amehara asher bo v'chol ha'etz asher basadeh, asher b'chol givolo saviv. Now, this is a very, very specific description of the location. So it's the field of Ephron, a field known uh, under a man known as Ephron, which is in the location known as Machpela, which is in front of another place known as Mamre. So we have three th- indicators of the, of the location. It is the field of Ephron. It's in a place known as Machpela. It was a famous double cave. And it's it's in front of another place known as Mamre, which is probably the hill of what's known as today as Abu Snina um, in in Hebron. And it states the Hasadev Hamera Sherbo, the field and the cave which is in it, Vecholaets, and all the trees. Trees were also used to mark locations. So you put you, you don't just plant trees randomly. Sometimes the trees were also used to mark borders. So the trees which are in the field. Asher b'chol gevulo saviv, 
everything which is in the borders. This is how the tree is connected to the concept of borders. The trees probably marked the borders of the field and everything. It states in verse 18, L'Avraham le mikne l'ayne v'nechet was given to Abraham as a purchase, as a mikne comes with the word kanai. If you actually look at the Bible, uh, you'll notice that the word mikne is also used in many situations to describe livestock. Why? Because livestock was something you bought. Okay, you can't start livestock out of thin air. You have to start from something. So it's considered to be a mikne, something you purchase. So here as well, the word mikne is used here to indicate purchase. Abraham purchased, purchased this field before the eyes of the sons of Chet, for all those who come through his gate. Basically, everyone was there to give testimony that this thing was done. Okay? And only only after that is Abraham willing uh, to, to bury, um, to bury um, um, Sarah. Now, what's very interesting here as well is that we don't really go deep into the mourning. What we have here is that he laments her. It says, "Lispod Kota." He laments her and he cries over her. But we actually don't have a description of the of the mourning ritual itself. And what's interesting is that the Bible and the Torah itself, you know, you would think that things like this would appear. I mean, Judaism has a tendency to go into overdrive and start describing every single thing on the face of the planet, which includes all the rules of how to perform mourning and so on. And I think the subject of how to mourn um, is something that has to do with culture. This is this is what we can call the kind of like oral Torah or the oral traditions of people, because every society has. I mean, anyone's been following the stuff that I do. I point out the the, the anthropological side of everything, where it's important to realize that you have a lot of practices which are not mentioned in the Torah, which are very important. These are things that people did and it was part of culture but it wasn't documented in the Torah because not everything has to be seen as a commandment so mourning itself there were practices that people had there was ripping of clothing and messing up of hair and not eating that much and but on the other hand there were other practices like for example um, people used to bring food for example in a wake uh, today, what happens is, is, especially with Western culture, is that you're expected to feed everyone, but it's actually the, the other way around. In the ancient world, and in Judaism to this very day, when you go to someone's house of mourning, you actually bring the food to help the, the, indiv the individual mourning, uh, to, or the individual's mourning, to, um, to give them time to mourn so other people take care of them. So you bring food, you sit with them, you don't allow them to be there by themselves, but you also give them time to mourn. It's There's a psychological process that people have to go through. Um, there's a very famous story that my dad told me, and something that he had to deal with as well. And there's a story of a... During the times of Rashi, um, lived in, who lived in France in the Middle Ages, there was a story of a family that a member of the family um, was murdered. I think it was connected somehow to the Crusades. Or, um, actually, doesn't make, actually, no, the Crusades, it does make two sense. The Crusades, Crusades, Crusades continue into the 13th century. Um, I'm losing my voice a little bit. I apologize. And they, um, they lost a member of family. And it was a time of the year that you're not supposed to be mourning. And... Rashi was asked what to do in this situation. I think the family was even living in his city. And he allowed them to mourn. He said that they need this process. They need the ability to mourn. If they won't, it, it can drive people crazy. So mourning and feeling sad is, is part of the process. And um, I don't want to finish with a sad note, so let's move on to one last thing that appears here, the concept of marriage. I, many years ago, did a program about marriage, and marriage is a is an interesting subject, because the Torah, again, doesn't give us too much details about how you get married. So it sounds more like, okay, you live together, you kind of come to some kind of an agreement with the family, and that's it. But actually, marriages were a lot more complex than that, and what's actually done to this very day in Judaism is very close to what was done in biblical times. You had a marriage contract, you had a dowry you had to pay, 
you had agreements that had to be fulfilled, there was a waiting period, and so on. So marriage, like any negotiation, was a negotiation. You had to negotiate with the family, because the family of the bride is giving up a functional member of family. So what we see here with the servant, who, by the way, a lot of people recognize as, as, as Eliezer, but really, when you look closely, the name Eliezer doesn't appear anywhere. It's a latter midrash that claims that it was Eliezer, but really, some of the calculations show that if this was Eliezer, Eliezer will be very, very, very old. So there's this opinion, there's a very strong opinion that says this is not Eliezer, this is someone else. And, um, but in any case, it doesn't really matter who it is, though, just remember, the name Eliezer doesn't appear, and the negotiation he goes through here, and in I am this. I, I belong to this family, and therefore it's a wealthy family. And the, the, he offers gifts, and you know when can we take her, and so on. It's a negotiation. And these usually were actually made into contracts. And there's an interesting correlation between some of the information about marriage that we find in Nuzi, which is a very important site. There's a lot of interesting documents that were found there, and things that were done in the Bible. So marriage, and I'm planning on doing something a bit more complex about marriage eventually, uh, but marriage was really a negotiation, it was really a, a discussion and a contract. And the Ketubah to this very day, you know, people say, oh, the Ketubah was uh, invented by one of the Jewish sages, and I think that this is not accurate. He didn't invent it. What he actually did was create a Ketubah that actually protected women's rights more than the regular documents that we find. A lot of documents go in, he promised to pay this, she promised that, and so on. And But it really was more of a negotiation between the, the future husband or the potential husband and her family, what her, what her father gets, what the family gets. And I think that the the, the, the change, I think it was Rabbi Shimon ben Shatach or something, or Shetach, so it depends who you ask how you read his name, um, I, th I think it was him, it might, be, might have been someone else, um, that what he did there was he tweaked the document to protect the, to protect the woman herself, because he knew that if she gets divorced or widowed, there's no one to protect her. So he didn't invent the Ketubah, he tweaked it to, to, to protect women's rights. In any case, um, obviously marriage is always more... Is, is more Interesting when it's through love and so on, but we need to remember back then it didn't really work like that. Um, some people ask about the concept of a prenup. Prenup is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, it's not against Torah to have a prenup, but again, it kind of it kind of gives a sour feeling when you're getting married with someone you love, and 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 things like that. And I know not all marriages work out, but to create a prenup is is like to say from the from the get go. Okay, so if we get divorced. We haven't gotten married yet, and we're already talking about getting divorced. I mean, this is ridiculous. Um, but on the other hand, the idea of protecting your assets and so on was something that they knew back then as well. Um, so in any case, I hope this recording was interesting. I apologize for my voice. I'm still recovering. This flu almost developed into full-fledged, uh, full-blown uh, pneumonia, so I'm still struggling with my voice. But in any case, I hope you enjoyed this recording. Hope it gave you more insight about the Torah. And uh, again, as usual, hope if there's any question, you can contact me. Any questions about Hebrew or Hebrew classes, Hebrew in Israel at gmail.com. And uh, I want to wish everyone a Shabbat Shalom, peaceful Shabbat.